This is the third narrated presentation for Biology 101, Module 1, Introduction to Biology. During this presentation, a discussion of important terms and topics, such as hypothesis, theory, the scientific method, and types of variables in scientific experiments will be discussed. The classification of organisms is known as taxonomy. Organisms are classified based on the similarities they share. For example, any organism in the group mammalia share the characteristics of body hair and producing milk. There are eight levels of taxonomy with the broadest groups sharing very general features like possess a backbone in the case of vertebrates, while the more specific groups share very specific detail. The levels of classification from broadest to most specific are domain, kingdom, phylum or divisions, class, order, family, genus, species. The modern system of taxonomy was developed in the 1700s. This system uses binomial nomenclature or the two name naming system. That is, every species on the planet is named by genus, general group, and species specific group. There are several rules to consider with binomial nomenclature. The name of the genus is always capitalized, and the name of the species is always lowercase. Both the genus and species names are italicized or underlined, but never both italicized and underlined. One example of binomial nomenclature name is the one you see here in the presentation for humans, Homo sapiens. Notice that the Homo genus is capitalized and sapiens, the species, is lowercase. Also notice they are both italicized. Recall that they can be italicized or underlined, but not both. To review the first part of this presentation, a taxonomy is the classification of organisms. All organisms are classified by eight different levels of organization, from broadest to most specific. Domain, kingdom, phylum or division, class, order, family, genus, and species. The modern taxonomic system uses the rules of binomial nomenclature where the genus is capitalized and the species is lowercase, and both are underlined or italicized, but never both. When a scientist makes an observation, that observation must be tested for accuracy using a procedure known as the scientific method. Scientists develop and test predictions they make based on their prior knowledge. These predictions are known as hypotheses. For example, everyone at some point in their life has made the observation that plants require water, and that observation could be tested using the scientific method. In this case, two plants of the same species may be kept in an identical environment, but only one of them is watered. The plant that does not receive water should wilt after several days, while the plant that does receive water should thrive. This scientific method, this scientific experiment, supports the hypothesis that plants require water. Importantly, the opposite was proved wrong, that is, the experiment proved that plants that do not receive water will not be healthy. There are several specific steps involved in the scientific method. The first step is to make an observation of some natural phenomenon that you are interested in discovering how or under what conditions that phenomenon occurs. Next, to create a hypothesis that may explain the observation. There is no rule that says you cannot create several different alternative hypotheses. In fact, professional scientists commonly do this because knowing why something does not occur is sometimes just as important as knowing why something does not does occur. Then, an experiment must be designed to test different hypotheses. Scientific experiments involve what is known as a control group. The control group is the portion of the experiment that is not manipulated at all, like watering a plant because the act of watering is a manipulation. 
The experimental group is the portion of the experiment that is manipulated, for instance, watering a plant. After your experiment is designed, you then carry out the experiment and record the results, known as data. The next steps include an analysis of the results using either quantitative methods or qualitative methods. Quantitative analysis involves statistical methods that test for significance, which is the statistical term for confidence. If your data yields significant results, then you say with confidence that the results did not happen randomly. Rather, they are a result of your manipulation of the experimental group. Qualitative results do not involve statistical methods and may be stated simply as something either was observed or not observed, such as the plant growing or wilting depending on whether or not it was watered. During the last steps of the scientific method, you make conclusions by interpreting your data and determining whether your hypothesis was correct or needs to be revised. In order to be certain your results are correct, you should be able to repeat your experiment and get the same results. We have previously discussed why scientific knowledge is important. Therefore, it is important to share your data with others so they may benefit from your knowledge. Again, using the plant watering experiment, you should let others know that watering plants is important. It will wilt and die. When you set up an experiment, remember you have both a control group and an experimental group. The experimental group is the one that tests your hypothesis by altering some variable. The conditions that you change in an experiment, as well as the effects those changes have on the experiment, are known as variables. Independent variables are the manipulations that you cause, while dependent variables are the effects your manipulation has on the group. In the case of our plant experiment, the independent variable is the amount of water given to each plant, while the dependent variable is the height of the plant because the height of the plant depends on how much water it receives. Variables can also be controlled, uncontrolled, or confounding. We will use temperature of the plant watering experiment to highlight the differences between these types of variables. First, a controlled variable is a variable that a scientist has control over. Conducting the plant experiment in a temperature controlled room would mean the scientist has control over temperature. Thus, temperature in the situation, this situation, is a controlled variable. An uncontrolled variable then is a variable that a scientist has no control over, such as if the plant experiment were conducted outside. Uncontrolled variables may or may not affect an experiment. But if it does affect the experiment, it is also known as a confounding variable. An example of a confounding variable is the plant experiment being conducted outside, so the scientist has no control over the temperature. The temperature may drop below freezing during the days you are observing the plants and cause both watered and unwatered plants to die. If you were not aware of the confounding variable of freezing temperatures, you may conclude that watering a plant will cause it to die. In this module, we also discussed the scientific method, experiments, and variables. Scientific experiments are used to test observations of the natural world. The steps of the scientific method or the scientific experiment involve making an observation, creating a hypothesis, which is a plausible prediction, designing an experiment with both a control group and an experimental group, performing the experiment to test the hypothesis, analyzing the results, interpreting those results to draw conclusions, repeating the experiment as necessary, and finally sharing your data with others. Remember, there are different ways of describing variables. A variable can be independent or dependent. It can also be controlled, uncontrolled, and confounding.